Um, thank you for being here. Today is a very special day for us. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, with us a very special personality. Uh, a person that I think that his background, his theoretical research and his mentality uh, is, uh, is of those people that they have a big influence uh, in architectural thinking. Um, and this is why we consider that um, he will be uh, giving us new food for thinking. Uh, for the people that they don't know, I would like to uh, read a very short uh, bio of Philip. Uh, uh, Philip Paul is a freelance writer. Previously worked for over 20 years as an editor for the international science journal Nature. He writes uh, regularly in the scientific and popular media and has authored many books on the interactions of the sciences, the arts and the wider culture, including the self-made tapestry, pattern formations in nature, hydrogen to oxygen, the biography of water, bright earth, universe of stone, the music instinct, and his latest book, Unnatural, the heretical idea of making people. Uh, his book, Critical Mass, won the 2005 Avengers Prize for science books. And uh, with this, we want to really thank you for being here with us tonight. And help me welcome Philip Paul. I was just saying that it's, uh, I'm always interested to give talks to um, architectural centres of one sort or another, and I've been fortunate to be asked to do that in the past, but it's uh, particularly interesting to come to, usually when I go to architecture departments or centres, it looks like any other university department, whereas it's fantastic to see a, sort of a huge space like this where there are machines for making things. Um, that's very stimulating, and I think probably also relevant in a way to uh, the kinds of ideas I might be talking about. Um, I want to begin with this quote. To the natural philosopher, there is no natural object unimportant or trifling. A soap bubble, an apple, a pebble. He walks in the midst of wonders. These were the words of the... Um, astronomer and chemist John Herschel in the 19th century um, during what the writer Richard Holmes has recently called the Age of Wonder. This was a time when science was finding mysteries and marvels in all corners of creation and science itself was starting to look like a romantic voyage of discovery. And scientists often found themselves in awe of the sublime beauties and mysteries of nature. Now, for scientists in this era, this voyage of discovery was often a literal one. Most famously, of course, there was the voyage of the Beagle. But Richard Holmes' book, called The Age of Wonder, which I'd recommend to anyone, it's a fantastic read of the science of this time, the early 19th century, and it opens with an earlier voyage, the voyage of James Cook, to Tahiti on the Endeavour in 1769. And the official botanist on board of the, the Endeavour was Joseph Banks, who nine years later became very eminent and became, was elected as the president of the Royal Society. Uh, but just three years after that trip to Tahiti, Joseph Banks took part in a very different expedition. He, was, uh, he went to Iceland, and on the way to Iceland, he stopped off at this place, the, I, the island of Staffa, near Mull, uh, just off the, the coast of Scotland, where Joseph Banks was awestruck by this, uh, this geological phenomenon that he found. This is Fingal's Cave, and it's named after the legendary Irish giant Finn McCool, who, whose story was brought to Scotland by early Irish settlers. Now, Fingal's Cave, uh, as already known, it has been the inspiration to, uh, to several other, uh, to several artists. Um, Felix Mendelssohn wrote uh, uh, an ode to this, uh, to this cave in his Hebrides suite in um, 1829. And this, uh, down the bottom here, is um, J.F.W. Turner's depiction of, of Fingal's Cave. 
But what struck Joseph Banks about Finkel's Cave uh, was something that was more um, uh, attributable to the scientific mind than to the artistic. He said this. He said, compared to this, what are the cathedrals or palaces built by men? Mere models or playthings, as diminutive as his works will always be when compared with those of nature. What now is the boast of the architect? Regularity, the only part in which he fancied himself to exceed his mistress, nature, is here found in her possession, and here it has been for ages undescribed. And what he was talking about were these, uh, these pillars of basaltic rock, which you can see uh, even more clearly on the corresponding structure that was, that's on the other side of the, uh, of the Irish Sea, in Ireland itself, on the coast of Nor uh, Northern Ireland, in County Antrim, the Giant's Causeway. And in fact, in legend, this, these two structures were part of the same um, structure that had been built by this giant, Finn McCool, as a great land bridge between the, uh, the, the, the two places. And you see uh, here this honeycomb structure that the rocks have. These very regular cracks in the, in the uh, volcanic rock. Now, when we make an architectural pattern like this, it's through careful planning and construction. Each element has to be individually cut to shape and laid in place. And the message there seems to be that making a pattern requires a patterner, requires a designer. But at Fingal's Cave and at the Giant's Causeway, the forces of nature have conspired to produce a pattern without, we have to assume, any blueprint or foresight or design. So this is an example of spontaneous pattern formation. And this sort of pattern was Perfectly familiar to scientists of Joseph Banks' time. In fact, uh, this sort of uh, this sort of uh, hexagonal pattern that you find at the Giant's Causeway had been known for millennia, ever since people began to keep bees. And they knew that this kind of hexagonal packing happens um, also in layers of bubbles, of identical bubbles that they all automatically form this sort of shape. Um, and this second case looks particularly straightforward to understand because the pattern here is guided simply by the action of surface tension in these films of uh, these liquid films that form the bubbles. Now, soap films have the property that they seek out a shape that minimizes their total surface area, subject to whatever boundary constraints they're placed under. And this principle has been used, I'm sure you're all familiar with the way this principle was used by the architect Frey Otto for some of his tent-like designs, such as this one, the stadium for the Munich Olympics. Um, and the idea here, partly, was that these, by mimicking these, uh, the shapes that these soap films form, you're minimizing the amount of material that you need to make them. But when soap films intersect, as they do in a flooding or in a raft of bubbles that I showed you earlier, there are rules that govern the shape that they take up. And these rules were first deduced in the 19th century by the Belgian physicist Joseph Antoine Ferdinand Plateau. And he reasoned that soap films at a junction like this have to, have to uh, find an arrangement where all the forces that are acting are in balance. And he found that um, at a junction of three identical bubbles, like this, that you find in these bubble, uh, in these bubble rafts, that the films will always intersect at this angle of 120 degrees. And the result then, when you stack uh, many of these together, is that you automatically get this honeycomb pattern. Uh, but then what happens when the bubbles are stacked in three dimensions as a foam? Well, there, Plato found that when soap films meet at a vertex, there are always four of them, no more and no less, and that uh, they will always meet at an angle, this so-called tetrahedral angle of 109 and a half, roughly, degrees. And this is the arrangement that guarantees mechanical stability of the bubble wall, so that the forces acting are always in balance. Well, then the question arose, does a real foam obey these rules? Uh, well, there are two factors that are play here. The, the, in a foam, the polyhedra that, that are formed 
have to, uh, first of all, they have to satisfy Plato's rules about the mechanical balance of forces, and also they're trying to minimize their total surface area. So is there a way that you can divide up three-dimensional space that satisfies both of those constraints? Well, scientists have pondered this for a long time, and here's some of the answers that they've suggested. Um, the one that I've labeled B here is, was suggested by Lord Kelvin, the Anglo-Irish uh, scientist in 1887, and it's a 14-sided polyhedron made by chopping off the corners of a regular octahedron. Uh, it doesn't quite satisfy Plato's rules exactly, but if you just distort the edges a little bit, then you can find, you can find a way of arranging this that pretty much does satisfy those rules. And uh, Kelvin's hypothesis was that this was the shape of, uh, the, of the fundamental shape of, uh, of the bubbles in a foam. This was the one that would uh, be the most economical. But he had no mathematical proof of that. And in fact, when people started looking at uh, foams in, uh, in the mid 20th century, they found that actually most of them didn't have these Kelvin shapes at all. In fact, mostly they were structured like this one key down here. A, with a mixture of uh, he hexagonal and pentagonal faces. All the same, that didn't, uh, that didn't disprove Kelvin's proposal that an ideal foam, a perfect foam, would actually have these, uh, the, the, these upper cell shapes. But in the uh, 1990s, 1993 in fact, two physicists working at Trinity College in Dublin discovered that there was an even more economical way to pack these Cell, these cells together in a foam, and this was their solution. Um, and it's a very complicated solution. It contains no fewer than eight polyhedra in the repeating unit of the, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the foam. And it's made from several different types of polyhedra that have uh, pentagonal and hexagonal faces. And they show that, that if you stack these together in a foam, you get 0.3% less surface area than you do in a Kelvin foam, so it's very slightly better. And very recently, in fact, um, just at the end of last year, the same physicists managed to find, uh, managed to create this foam experimentally. Here's a, an image of what it looks like, rather useful actually, I think. Now, um, you probably also, some of you will know, that this um, ideal foam, this so-called Weir Phelan foam, uh, named after its inventors, was used by, in this structure, the swimming stadium for the Beijing Olympics, called the water cube. So each of these cells here was cut out from, uh, from clear plastic and constructed um, and, and, and made in place in this network of, of metal struts that uh, was placed there. It doesn't look very regular at all. It was, that was by design. They took a slice through this foam um, that was chosen so that it would give this very sort of irregular pattern. Um, and so, in principle, you could say that this design saves you materials because, again, it's using the, the, smallest, uh, the smallest amount of, uh, of surface area that we know of in order to fill the space. However, you can imagine that the complicated engineering task of making this sort of structure and filling it up pretty much does away with any advantage you get from saving uh, materials. So, it's really more of a triumph of aesthetics over economy. Um, but let's go back now to the bees' honeycomb, um, because there's an interesting moral uh, that you can learn from that about pattern formation. Um, the ancient Greeks presumed that uh, bees have, have, have to have some intrinsic sense of geometry to build a structure as regular as a honeycomb. Um, and um, the, the mathematician Pappas of Alexandria claimed that the bees had wisely selected the cell shape that could hold the most honey. And in the 18th century, the French physicist René Antoine de Réaumur suggested that in fact the, the hexagonal pattern is chosen because it's the one that uses the least area of cell wall and therefore the least amount of wax to divide up the, the given area into cells of equal size and shape. And that's true, but there's more to the puzzle than that because in fact in the honeycombs you find two layers of these cells back to back. And there's a question of what you do at the boundary. What's the most economical way to, uh, to, to cap these cells? Now, that's a tricky question to answer, and Derevio couldn't do it himself. He asked the Swiss mathematician, Samuel Koenig, to solve that problem for him. And Koenig did this, but in order to do that, he had to use the calculus, which had only recently then been devised by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz. 
And he found that the best way, the most economical way to create these end caps was this one here, which it turns out to be precisely what the bees use. Now, it's too much to suppose, for these men to suppose, that bees knew calculus before Newton did. And so Bernard Fontenelle, the secretary of the French Academy of Sciences, asserted that this had to be the work of God. He said that the bees were blindly using the highest mathematics by divine guidance and command. So, you see, this is where consideration of natural pattern formation tended inevitably to lead in those days. It seemed to be the fingerprint of intelligent design. And of course, in the 18th century, the only place that design and intelligence could come from was God. Well, before going any further, perhaps I should define what I, what I mean when I'm talking about pattern. Um, or rather, I'm going to confess that I'm, I'm not going to try to rigorously define it at all. I mean, we notice, of course, all sorts of patterns around us, uh, not just in space, but in time. The repeating patterns of day and night, or the patterns of the four seasons, or the pattern in a piece of music by Bach's day. And we recognize patterns of behavior. And in fact, some people would say that the whole of science is about recognizing patterns and regularities in nature. But I'm going to talk here primarily about patterns in space. And by that I mean that the space is filled with identical or nearly identical elements that recur in some regular arrangement. And that's still a bit vague, and it's meant to be a bit vague. Um, but here's the kind of image that comes to mind when we talk colloquially about patterns. Um, it's a repetitive array of identical forms in some sort of geometric arrangement. And for mathematicians, patterns like this can be defined by their symmetry properties. For example, whether you can shift the whole pattern by a certain amount and leave it looking the same as it was before, or whether you can reflect it in some mirror plane and again leave it looking identical. Um, now, the, the, um, the, 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 for many of the natural patterns that I'll be talking about, this isn't true. They don't have these perfect symmetries. Um, nevertheless, I think you'll find no problem in regarding them as patterns. I mean, here's one of them, for example, and you can sort of see that there's something patterned about this, but none of these two elements in this pattern are identical, and we can't manipulate it in any way without uh, changing the way it looks. But the key feature here is that the pattern elements are roughly the same, roughly of the same type and the same size and the same spacing. And I'm also going to blur the boundaries between pattern and form. Um, when we talk about pattern, we tend to mean an arrangement of elements that repeats again and again. Well, does that include an object like this? What distinguishes a tree from the pattern of a zebra's skin is that one part of it is no longer more or less equivalent to any other. There's a kind of a hierarchy involved in the, this system of branching. But I'd suggest that the key feature we recognize here um, that, call, that leads us to call it a pattern is that there's some sort of organization to it. There's some sort of logic to this structure. If you compare it to a truly random arrangement of elements, you can sort of see what I mean. Um, and in fact, you can make a case that pattern or form can refer to any structure that isn't truly random. And that's the mystery that we have to explain when we're trying to explain natural pattern formation. Why isn't everything just random? Because that's what the second law of thermodynamics seems to dictate. That is the law that is saying that everything in the universe tends towards a state of higher entropy, of greater disorder, of greater randomness. And pattern formation, in contrast, is the emergence of regularity from something that is irregular to begin with. And that makes it sound as though the, the appearance of pattern must be something to do with creating symmetry. But in fact, it's the opposite. It's an unpatterned, uniform system that has the highest symmetry, because then you can do anything to it. You can rotate it and reflect it and move it, and it looks the same, because it's uniform everywhere. And so when a uniform system like that changes to one that has some sort of organization or pattern to it, you're actually lowering or breaking the symmetry. Now, less obviously, perhaps, a random uh, uh, system is, in that regard, equivalent to a uniform one, because randomness, the randomness averages out, on, uh, and on average, any part of the system is the same as any other, as you can sort of see here. In fact, you know, if you think about it, um, randomness j it, it just becomes uniformity if you look at it far enough away. 
until it just sort of blurs into something uniform. And um, you can uh, see that as well in, in the case of a glass of water. So, you know, uh, to us, this is just a sort of uh, uniform, homogeneous liquid. Um, but when you look at it closely enough on the molecular scale, you see that it's made up of something that is actually random. When water freezes to ice, that randomness is lost. So we start off with this. In the ice crystals, the water molecules, instead of being random, they stack together in a regular pattern. So this is an example of what scientists call symmetry breaking. What's really remarkable and what's really the focus of what I want to talk about is that sometimes this symmetry breaking gives us an unexpected bonus of order. So we can explain this molecular scale regularity of an ice crystal by thinking of the ways that the water molecules are obliged to pack together in a, uh, in a crystalline array. But sometimes when that happens, we don't get this. We get this. So where did that order come from? Well, I'll come back to that. The most curious thing, though, about these natural patterns, indeed, really the central aspect of their scientific study, is that they seem to come from a quite limited palette. So there are, there, there, there are often uh, patterns that we recur again and again in systems that seem to have nothing to do with one another. So the hexagons of Fingal's Cave, for example, put us in mind of the hexagons of a honeycomb or of a bubble raft. But why should those hexagons crop up in both situations? And here are some other examples of hexagonal structures in nature. Now, it, it seems that there are some pattern-forming processes then that don't depend on the detailed specifics of what's going on in the system, but that crop up across the board, even bridging the non-living and the living worlds. And that's perhaps the most important message that I want you to take away today, that pattern formation has something universal about it. It doesn't respect the ordinary boundaries that we tend to draw between different sciences or different types of phenomena in nature. Here are some of the other recurring motifs uh, of patterns in, that we find in nature. Stripes, we've seen already. Spiral patterns are very common. And also branching patterns we've seen already. The big question is, do these patterns really have anything in common, or is this similarity in appearance just a coincidence? Well, many people have thought about that for a long time, but the first person to really tackle that question head on was this fellow, the Scottish zoologist Darcy Wentworth Thompson. And he did it in this book published in 1917 called On Growth and Fall. This was Thompson's masterpiece. It was a huge work that collected together all that was then known about pattern and form in nature in a, a synthesis of biology and natural history, mathematics, physics, and engineering. It was a beautifully written book, but it was also decades ahead of its time. Some of the questions that Darcy Thompson was asking were ones that, that for, the, for which the tools to understand the question only developed several decades later. And as Thompson pointed out, and as the title suggests, in biology, and often in the non-living natural world, pattern formation isn't a static thing. It arises from growth. Everything is what it is, Tom Thompson said, because it got that way. So the answer to the riddle of pattern lies in how it got to be that way. And that's less obvious than it sounds. If you think of a, a bridge, or a paddy field, or a microchip, <coughs> The form is explained by what it does, what it's meant to do, not by how it was made. And to Darcy Thompson, Darwinism seemed to do that same thing, to, to explain life by, in terms of what it does, not how it got to be that way. Um, now, one of the classic examples of spontaneous pattern formation in uh, Darcy Thompson's book that he tried to explain was the one I've shown here. Uh, this is uh, taken directly from his book, and uh, on this side you see a, a modern uh, experiment of the same sort. What you're seeing here are bands of salt, coloured uh, salt, precipitated in a gel-like medium that has been infused with uh, the chemicals that make up the salt. So they just, get, they just inf diffuse through this gel, and every so often they form these bands, and they sort of form successively as the diffusion proceeds. They're called lysergang bands, or lysergang rings, after the German chemist who discovered them. 
And Thompson um, suggested that maybe they might be related to the bands that you find in some minerals, in agate and onyx, for example. Some others suggested that perhaps these bands might be a kind of simplified version of the markings that you can see on zebras and tigers and butterflies. And we'll see that that turns out to be surprisingly close to the mark. But no one could really explain them at this time, certainly Darcy Thompson couldn't. The explanation finally emerged from a quite different area of chemistry. In the 1950s, a Soviet biochemist named Boris Belusov was uh, trying to understand um, metabolism, was trying to understand digestion, how glucose gets broken down by enzymes. And he, he devised a chemical reaction that seemed to mimic um, this process of glycolysis. And uh, it was a reaction that um, he mixed it together and it went from being yellow to being colourless. However, it didn't stop there. It then went back to being yellow, and then colourless, and then yellow. It kept changing direction. It was an oscillating reaction. Now, this just didn't seem to make sense. In fact, it seemed to violate the second law of thermodynamics. And so other chemists would have nothing to do with this. They, would, they said, this is nonsense. It just has to be a mistake. And Belusov couldn't get these results published anywhere. Um, they only started to get taken seriously when a colleague of his called Anatol Shabatinsky, also in Moscow, found a different scheme where this color change was even more pronounced. It went from blue to red to blue to red. Um, and it did so as the clock ticks, it kept switching back and forth. And so this was a, uh, something that was really hard to ignore. You can see it just happened before your eyes. Um, now we now know that this reaction, the so-called belusov jabotinsky reaction, is just one example of a wide range of chemical reactions that oscillate like this. And then in fact they don't violate the second law of thermodynamics. Um, because these oscillations don't go on forever, eventually they die out and it settles down into a steady state. Um, however, you can keep them going by feeding in fresh reagents and taking out the ones that have been used up, and then they'll just keep going forever. So by, by doing that, you're keeping this system away from equilibrium. You're making it a non-equilibrium system. And what's going on here is basically you have these two states, red and blue, that can switch between one another. Um, and the, but what, what, what is really crucial to this process is that they're both autocatalytic. As the red stuff, if you like, as the red stuff starts to form, it sets up the conditions for creating more of itself. There's a runaway process here. And eventually it just gets exhausted. You've used up all of the, the reagents. And that sets up the conditions that will switch over to the blue process. And the same thing happens until it runs out of steam. It exhausts itself and switches back again. And so this process is a balance between two things. How quickly that reaction is happening and how quickly fresh um, reagents can diffuse into it from, from outside to replenish it. So it's a balance between reaction and diffusion. And these sorts of reactions are now known as reaction diffusion systems. And it's, um, if, if you mix it, if you keep the system mixed, then you just get this color change happening everywhere. But if you let, let it settle in a shallow dish and just, just sort of let it, uh, let it react, particularly if you slow down the diffusion by making it happen in a gel, then you get these waves of change of blue and red spreading throughout the system in these fantastic patterns, these target patterns and spiral patterns, these chemical waves that spread through the system. And in 1952, the mathematician Alan Turing identified another kind of reaction diffusion system, which produced not station, not moving uh, chemical waves like this, but stationary patterns. So here's Turing, and he came up with this theory. It was just a theory at that point that this could happen in chemical systems. He developed it by, because he was trying to understand how embryos form from fertilized eggs. And if you think about it, this is again a, a problem of symmetry breaking. You start off with a spherically symmetrical ball of, of, of identical cells, but somehow that symmetry has to break so that some of them develop into some things, like head and the limbs and so on, and some into others. So how does that happen? No, no one knew in the 1950s. And Turing came up with this idea that, it could, that a, a system like this could become spontaneously patterned. And his theory was quite abstract and complicated, and it was only in the 1970s that other scientists figure out, figured out what the crucial ingredients were 
and they were two types of diffusing chemical, which, uh, which Turing called morphogens, literally meaning shape formers. And um, here I sort of represented them. One, uh, of the, one of the diffusing chemicals is something called an activator. And again, it's autocatalytic. It, it, it sort of creates more of itself in this sort of uh, runaway feedback process. But the other of these chemicals is called an inhibitor. It's something that interrupts that process. And Turing found that if these two uh, components diffuse at different rates, specifically if the inhibitor diffuses more rapidly, then what can happen is that they can cause uh, the, the system to develop di a different chemical composition in different places in a way that, was, that, that creates a stationary pattern. And when it became possible to, sort of, uh, to, to uh, follow this process in computer simulations, something that was only really possible in the 1980s and, and beyond, it became clear that Turing's chemical patterns have two general forms, spots and stripes. And um, it was not until 1990 that anyone found uh, a real system, a real uh, mixture of chemicals that would create these, uh, these patterns. And here's the first um, Turing, chemical Turing pattern that was discovered in 1990s. And then in the year, uh, a year later, um, uh, two researchers in Texas found a way to sort of make them spread throughout the whole system. So these are, these are computer results. This is a real chemical system. And these patterns stay there, even though the chemicals that are making them are constantly diffusing and reacting through the system. And these patterns, of course, put us immediately in mind of those animal markings that I mentioned before. Now, we uh, knew for a long time how these animal markings form because Rudyard Kipling told us how in his Just So stories. So he said, for example, the zebra got its stripes by standing in, a, um, in, in the forest and you know, some, somewhere the sun would come through and there'd be a, uh, sort of shadows imprinted on the, the skin. And of course, this was all completely fanciful. But to some people, it didn't seem any more fanciful than what Darwinism suggested as the origin of these uh, structures. Because Darwinism would say, quite rightly, that very often these, these animal markings are used for uh, camouflage, or for species recognition, or for warning markings, or whatever. And that's certainly true, but it doesn't say anything about how they get there in any particular embryonic leopard or zebra. And that was what left Darcy Thompson dissatisfied with Darwinism. Not that it was wrong in, in, a, in, a, in a particular sense, but it only explained the why and not the how, how these markings physically get there. And now Turing's theory seemed to offer a mechanism that perhaps there were biochemicals that acted as activators and inhibitors as the embryo grows and that imprint the skin with different patterns that switch on and off genes that make pigments. And it seems that this is very likely to be the reason for how these animal markings fall. Um, and in fact, Turing-type explanations have been put forward to explain all these different systems that we see, these quite complicated patterns that actually appear on leopards, which are not just simple spots and stripes, or patterns on ladybirds and so forth. Um, one of the clearest examples is the patterns that appear on angelfish. And what's interesting about them is that they don't just, they're not stationary, they're still developing. As the fish grows, they change. And you see this kind of unzipping of stripes that is mimicked in, the, uh, in a computer uh, simulation of what's going on here. Um, however, no one has found the, 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 the crucial, the clinching proof that this is what's going on, which would be the actual morphogens, the molecules that are creating these patterns. But they have found ones like this in a similar patterning system, which is how hair follicles form. So in mice, um, there have been morphogens identified, biochemicals that diffuse and create this system of, essentially the system of spots. And so it seems very likely that if it happens in mice, it happens in humans as well. Now, the stripes of things like angelfish and zebras that I showed you might put you in mind also of another kind of natural pattern in a completely different system. The ripples that appear in windblown sand, or the ripples that appear on the edge of a beach, um, where uh, the, the waves lack them. And 
you see that uh, there's a characteristic way in which these, uh, the, these stripes sort of divide and split and end and so on. So they're not perfectly regular, but clearly they have a more or less even spacing between them. And it's, in fact, it's, it's been argued that this it could be genuinely looked upon as another activator inhibitor system. Because the appearance of one of these ripples is a kind of a self-amplifying process, an autocatalytic process. If you think about it, if there's, if there's sand being blown uniformly across a surface, if a little bump appears just by chance because a little bit more sand gets deposited there, it sticks up into this windblown sand and collects more sand. The bigger it gets, the more it collects the sand. And so it's autocatalytic, it's self-amplifying. And at the same time, by collecting those grains, it depletes the wind just downstream and it stops there, so there's um, an inhibition of anything of another bump like this growing until it's a certain distance away. And so in this way, the, the argument is that you eventually get a more or less regular sequence of these stripes appearing. And um, this is basically what is going on in the, the appearance of sand ripples. Um, and uh, although it's, it is actually slightly more complicated than this, partly because the grains don't just stick where they strike, they perform a, a, a series of little jumps. And it's the size of those jumps that seems to set the width of the stripes apart from one another. And the same sorts of things are happening at different scales in, de in the desert, in windblown sand. And so you see not only these little ripples, but also dunes, and, you know, dunes with ripples superimposed on them. And also, you see that you don't just get these sort of stripe-like formations in dunes. You get all sorts of different patterns, particularly these crescent-shaped uh, so-called barkan dunes, but also you can get ones with several arms that come out, so-called star dunes. And um, you can get all sorts of extraordinary shapes if you change the conditions, the wind speeds, and the gravity, which is what happens on Mars. So there are dunes that have been identified on Mars that don't look like anything on Earth, but nevertheless, computer models that sort of explain this process in terms of how the sand is being moved by the wind seem to be able to reproduce a lot of these strange Martian dunes. Now, these, and also pretty much all of the patterns, patterning processes I've discussed so far, they, they come about because the features are initiated at random. They happen just by chance, by ch a chance fluctuation. But then the pattern grows around those initial seeds according to well-defined rules for how the features are arranged. And that's a universal feature of natural patterns. That you, they start off with small random variations in a uniform state that then get amplified um, in ways that are non-random. And that's also tr that's true of many natural patterns. It's particularly true of patterns that have the so-called fractal form. So a fractal, crudely speaking, is a shape that looks the same at different levels of magnification. As you zoom in, you, you just see more and more of it, but it looks pretty much qualitatively the same. And real coastlines, of course, are, um, are, are like this. They have this fractal form. Um, and the, the key characteristic of fractals, probably you're mostly familiar with this, is that they have no, uh, no natural length. The length that you measure depends on the length of the yardstick you use. As you use a more, smaller and smaller step to measure the length, uh, you capture more and more of the ins and outs, and the length seems to get longer, indefinitely, for true fractals. Um, and this uh, fractal form is particularly common in many natural patterns that form branches, for example, cracks and river networks. And one of the universal roots for producing branch forms like this was first discovered as a way to try to explain the sort of branching patterns that we see in soot or in, um, in uh, uh, electrochemistry, where you deposit metals at an electrode and you get these complex sort of branching and ramifying forms. And this um, is going to be explained by a theoretical process called diffusion-limited aggregation, which sounds complex, but the, idea, the basic idea is quite simple. The idea is that you just have particles drifting around at random through space, and if they touch, they stick. That's all there is to it. They stick in precisely the arrangement that they form when they touch. Now, you might imagine that a process like that would just gradually grow you a, a sort of cluster that grow, grows bigger and bigger, a dense cluster, as you know, more and more particles stick. But in fact, 
it isn't dense at all. What it produces is, is something like this. And it doesn't take much thought to understand why that's so, because if you get a little sort of um, depression, a little fjord, if you like, in this structure, then a particle wandering around at random is going to have hardly any chance to get down to that, to fill in those gaps, before it just happens to touch the side and then it'll stick. And so they just can't get down there to fill in the gaps. And so it grows and grows in this very tenuous branching shape. And so here is one of those patterns that I spoke about at the beginning that isn't symmetrical, isn't regular, but that nevertheless seems to have some kind of order and logic to it. And this theory of diffuse limited aggregation has been modified and tinkered with to, understand, to explain all sorts of natural patterns, from river networks to even the growth of, and the appearance of cities. And that's an interesting one because it suggests that these natural rules of pattern formation, these natural processes, can happen in human systems as well. That, um, that we find that cities just go on growing regardless, in this same kind of ramified shape, regardless of planners' attempts to impose some kind of order and pattern on this, that there are natural laws according to which these sorts of systems grow. Um, but, one of the, but these highly branched forms that you get in diffusion limited aggregation probably also bring to mind another of the patterns I mentioned at the outset, this one. Um, and this is, the snowflake is particularly interesting because there's a, 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 an interesting balance here between order and regularity and this randomness. Um, now, because you can see that this, this isn't just like the sort of uh, the, the chaotic branching that we saw earlier, that there's some sort of, uh, there's some sort of symmetry imposed on this. Now, to understand this, um, it's not hard to understand how these needle-like forms grow on a snowflake. Um, there again, it's something like the growth of, uh, of sand dunes, because there again you have a runaway, self-amplifying process. What happens is it's called dendritic growth, and you can see it in metals that solidify too. And what happens is that as the surface grows, the solid surface grows from the liquid, so it's freezing here, and the crystal is growing, if you get a little bump, again, arising by chance, that bump is better at radiating away the heat that has to be got rid of before the, crystal, before the liquid um, can, can freeze. And so it starts to amplify itself, and it gets the, 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 the more it grows, the more it, it becomes able to grow further. And so this, it, this little bump quickly grows into a needle-like tip, gets thinner and thinner and thinner as it grows. And that's what's happening on these, uh, in these crystals, that you, as, as a needle grows, little bumps grow on the side just by at random, and then they start shooting off as needles as well. And so you get this hierarchical branching that's going on. However, of course, in the snowflake, if that doesn't happen, that doesn't give rise to chaos. It gives rise to this lovely hexagonal structure. And the reason for that was only understood really in the 1980s. And it is surprising that we see it comes from the molecular scale uh, regularity of the ice crystal itself. The fact that the water molecules are stacked together in these hexagons. That is enough to impose a kind of hexagonness on the space in which this branching is, is forming. So that you get a hexagonal symmetry at at, a, at scales millions of times bigger, scales big enough to see with the naked eye. So in both um, uh, these aggregation processes and in the growth of, uh, of sand dunes, what we've really got are grains, as are patterns uh, forming from grains moving around. And I want finally to look at patterning in a very particular kind of grainy medium, in which the grains are living organisms organisms that can move under their own steam. And here are patterns in some of those. These are all single-celled organisms, bacteria and, uh, and amoeba, that, are formed, that can form these um, extraordinary patterns because they can move and they can interact with one another. And what, they, what bacteria commonly do is they interact by uh, something called chemotaxis. They emit chemicals that either attract or perhaps repel other cells and that this interaction um, creates these very regular patterning, uh, pattern, um, uh, pattern systems.
And we can see those sorts of interactions giving rise to patterns also in much more complex creatures. We can see them in dynamic patterns like those that we see in the swarming of fish and of birds. And how these patterns arise was for a long time a mystery to ornithologists and to, to natural historians. Um, they even at some times were led to, to, to postulate some sort of telepathy between the creatures that was enabling them to know what they were all going to do and so they would all you know, turn at the same time. But it, it became clear, really, uh, over, only over the last few decades, that you don't need anything as complex as that. That this sort of organized, dynamic behavior can arise from very simple rules operating between the moving uh, uh, components of the system, only at a very local scale. All you need is for um, the, the moving uh, particles to have a tendency to align their motions with one another and to attract or repel each other just um, in the, their own neighborhood. So they don't know anything about what's going on you know, over in a different part of the swarm. However, that sort of large-scale order can arise spontaneously. And here's an example, just a snapshot of the sort of swarming that you can get in these computer models. And of course, these are now very familiar, so familiar that they've been used in lots of movies for simulating you know, things like uh, the flock of the swarm of bats in Batman Returns. Um, now, we don't quite see this in human movements, but we see something, I mean, at least we don't see it in, um, in, in, in physical space. This sort of herding and flocking is, is familiar in other contexts. You certainly get herding type copying behavior in things like economic markets, and we sort of see the consequences of that now. But you do have other kinds of regularities that occur in human movements. And here's one of them. Here's a, uh, a typical sort of crowded human situation. And if you look carefully at this, you can see that there are, um, that there are streams of people moving in different directions, following one another. How does that happen? Well, computer models of pedestrian motion have shown that probably something very similar is going on. And these were models that were developed in the 1990s and had very, again, very simple rules determining what was, gov what was governing people's um, uh, movements. And what they said was that people move around space um, with repulsive forces between us, which sounds like an odd thing to say because, of course, there aren't real repulsive forces, like forces of magnetism that you can measure. But the fact is that we act as though there were, as though there were repulsions between us. And just, you can see that just by thinking about a crowded beach. Um, and if you think about you know, how people move onto this beach and come and sit down, you know, no, no one's going to come down and just sit next, right next to this guy here. They tend to sit in the open spaces as if there was a repulsion that was keeping them apart. I've seen aerial pictures of beaches like this, I bet you've seen it in Barcelona actually, where you have an almost crystalline regularity, how people sort of space themselves apart, which is just like what you get from inanimate particles that repel one another. And these were the ingredients that were put into these models of pedestrian motion. So the idea was that people just move um, in a particular direction, you know, towards a di destination they want to get to, at a speed that suits them, and it may not be the same speed for everyone, and that there is a repulsive force that will tend to make them avoid collisions, so deviate from their motion if they get too close to someone else. So with just those ingredients, we can find all sorts of surprisingly realistic uh, behavior. And here's an example, a snapshot of people moving in opposite directions down a corridor. So blue and red are moving in opposite directions. And you see that what's happened here is that they again organize themselves into these streams. Now there's nothing in the ingredients of this model that tells you that's going to happen. There's nothing in the rules that says you've got to follow one another. It's something that spontaneously emerges when you just enact the rules that have been put in, the simple rules. Um, so there's a kind of self-organization here that's going on. And you find this in all sorts of other situations as well, how people move in intersections and through doorways and so on. And you, you probably, a lot of you are familiar with how some of these models are now being used to understand and uh, model and plan open spaces and how people will move around those open spaces. So for example, the company Space Syntax in London is uh, consulting to redesign some public spaces. And um, they've also been used to, uh, to try to understand and develop measures for crowd control. For example, they were used uh, for London's Notting Hill Carnival, 
to sort of predict how people will move around the carnival route. Um, so you know, they were just placed on this carnival route, and the, in particular what people were looking for was areas where there's likely to be bunching up of the crowd, so these potential flashbacks where you need to um, focus your crowd control measures. And more recently, these models have been used to try to understand how people move in the, um, the annual Muslim pilgrimage, pilgrimage, the Hajj, to Mecca, where in the past there have been uh, crowd disasters, there have been um, sort of panics and stampedes where many people have, been, have, have died. And so uh, these models were brought in to try to understand how people move and how they could be better organized and scheduled to minimize the risks of that sort. Um, and uh, finally, I want to just show, because it's a, a, a sort of a, a nice metaphor, I think, um, how these models have been used to understand how people move around grassy spaces. And what's, what's significant there is that when we move across grass, as opposed to a pavement or a road, we, oh, we leave a, a pattern, uh, we leave a, a trace of where we've gone. We tread down the grass a tiny bit, hardly noticeably, but if, if enough people follow in the same footsteps, a path gets worn away, and it gets worn away spontaneously. So how does that happen? What do those paths look like? There, you see, we're interacting sort of indirectly by leaving a trace of where we've been. And so this, uh, people try to model this by just feeding people into this, uh, into a, a, an area where they walk across, and as they walk, every walker slightly wears away this grass, which here has to be red grass. And uh, so they're coming and going through the, to the, from the corners of, uh, of this space. And to begin with, the trails that they wear down, these blue trails, are the most direct ones. Um, so they're just, just going in straight lines from one bit to another. However, as time goes on, this trail pattern evolves into a quite different one. It looks like this. It looks much more sort of organic and rounded. And what's striking is that now, none of these trails are the most direct routes between any of the points of entry and exit. They're a compromise between going for the direct route and tending to follow where other people have followed. And that's precisely the kind of pattern that you see um, here in this middle uh, area here. These trails would have just been spontaneously worn away by people walking from, the, you know, from these, common, these different blocks. Um, so again, you see you know, this same kind of curved organic space. And I think this is where I want to leave you, because I think um, that this is not just an example of the kind of patterning that might be relevant to spatial planning and design, but that it's a kind of metaphor more generally, because it shows that the better we understand the kind of spontaneous collective modes into which people seem naturally inclined to organize themselves, then the better chance we'll have to plan and design environments and spaces according to how people really want spontaneously to use them, rather than trying to impose some arbitrary choice of how we think they should use them. So understanding emergent order not only offers us new creative choices, new ways to design things, but might point us to solutions that are more efficient and safer and more harmonious with the flow of human life. Thanks very much.
the, the, the similarity, the, the hexagonness of the snowflake, really, I think, has no relation. It's pure coincidence um, that it looks, you know, a bit like the, hexagon, the hexagonality of bubbles, of soap bubbles uh, and films. Because um, in the case of the snowflake, it's the fact that ice just happens to have this hexagonal structure, the way the, molecule, the water molecules pack together. That's to do with the shape of water molecules themselves. In other crystals, you know, there are other kinds of symmetries, maybe cubic symmetries or whatever. And in fact, some people have speculated whether in carbon dioxide, the, in solid carbon dioxide, dry ice, they pack together with a cubic sort of arrangement. And so maybe, you know, does that mean on Mars you get cubic snowflakes of dry ice. I don't think you do, I've no one has ever found that, but it's possible that, you know, that would change, uh, it would change things. Whereas with the, uh, the hexagons of, the, of cracks and soap bubbles, there it just so happens that their hex, that hexagonal relate, uh, arrangement is the one that uh, creates the, 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 the best balance of forces. So for, um, for the, for the um, uh, for the bubbles, it means that the, the, the soap films are in equilibrium that way. For the cracks of the, uh, the, the, devil's, uh, the giant's causeway, it's quite interesting that it, it seems that what happens there is that the cracks can start off random, but as, the, as they descend through the cooling lava, they become more and more hexagonal, because that just relieves the stress that builds up in the, in the, the shrinking solid rock. Um, it, it relieves the stress in the most efficient way. However, you know, I think it's it, it, it's not just coincidence that it's hexagonal because that um, he, he, because hexagonal symmetry is, uh, is is you could say the simplest way to break the symmetry in two dimensions. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it, you know, it does it in a way that where it, that, that is sort of fairly sort of evenly spaced out. So you know, if you're trying to uh, relieve stress in cracking, then a hexagonal ar uh, arrangement gives you a, a good, a nice sort of distribution of stresses that a, that a, a cubic one wouldn't do. Um, so it's really about that. It's just about you know that happens to be the sort of the the the, the first way that symmetry breaks in two dimensions. And in urbanism, there is a great uh, evolution in nature, uh, observing and, uh, let's say, urban planning. Uh, what would be your answer in uh, an architecture that is uh, well educated now in, uh, in the nature formations, but still is um, oriented in formalism? Um. I'm not an ideal person to speak about that because you'll have a better you'll have a better feeling for those tensions than I will within architecture. I guess um, you know I know that there are architects who are interested simply in the same sorts of questions of trying to understand how uh, most efficiently to to use space to create the most efficient flows. Or, for example, I mean there was a an ex uh, a study done of how people move around galleries. The Tate Gallery was the, the one that was looked at, um, and it was discovered that uh, that the how often people visit different rooms in the galleries didn't really have anything to do with what was actually on display there. It was just the way the space was set up tended to direct people, you know, one way and not another, which is definitely not what ga gallery designers want. You know, they want to make sure that everyone will just naturally tend to drift all over. And so, you know, that's something that's worth knowing, uh, sort of, what, you know, how naturally people will move around the space. Um, but, I mean, I guess what the, the sense that I've had within architecture is that the interest is not simply in those sorts of practical questions of how to make spaces safer or more efficient. It's also um, in questions of um, what creative possibilities arise from letting go of a top-down sort of theory of how space should be organized and just seeing you know, what arises from particular rules, from particular sort of local rules about how different units can interact. 
Um, and there, I, I think you, you can see an interesting um, sort of analogy there with the way uh, insect and animal architectures arise. That, you know, to some extent, there's a kind of a, an optimization going on, for example, in termite nests. And you know there are all sorts of interesting things that happen in termite nests in terms of how the, the channels that arise can help air to circulate and to keep the humidity constant. Um, but you know there's there's no planner, uh, there's no obvious sort of unique way of doing this. It's just sort of local um, sort of interactions between you know one termite and another that create this spontaneous structure that happens to have. Some, some beneficial properties, and if it didn't have those, or if it was, you know, if it, if it, if it suppressed air circulation, then evolution would have, you know, would have taken care of that, and you know, th th those particular termites wouldn't have got very far. So there's obviously some sort of, if you like, some grander scheme there going on that is making sure that something is a good solution. But nevertheless, you know, it's not, uh, in a sense. You know, evolution isn't trying to impose that. It's just not trying to impose anything. You know, it's, it's still something that's spontaneously arising from the interaction of components. And so, my my impression is that architects are interested in that sort of uh, that 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 uh, that boundary between you know what works well and is efficient and is justifiable in those terms, and what is just a creative and perhaps an aesthetically uh, interesting response to a particular constraint on how space is going to be used. Under which it's operating, and that's that's uh, you know, but 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 that those two are feeding back on each other. Um, and I mean, I, I like the, the example in the, in the park near me. Um, one has finally sort of given way to another. Just this kind of thing happened that people wore down their own trails, they ignored the paths that were laid down. And just uh, six months ago, they, clearly the council thought, well, that's the way it is then. And they, they turned the, these spontaneous trails into tarmac ones. And you know, I think that, that, that I'm sure there are other examples in the urban environments where you know, the, the human tendency to do some things a certain way will change the, the constraints you know, under which it operates. And I also think it's interesting that um, that you can see differences, you, there, there are apparently cultural differences in that. In fact, they clearly are, and you'll know this, you know, that different cities and different cultures have different characteristics that, um, uh, you know, for example, in Arabic cultures, uh, there, there are particular ways that urban spaces are used and divided up that clearly relate to the differences in sort of public and social life compared to the West. Um, you know, which doesn't mean to say that there, is, there aren't sort of universal things, there aren't common things about it, but there are the boundary conditions under which they operate and then change. So yeah, definitely that it's, it's a two-way process between the constraints and the sort of spontaneity. Very similar question. The, sometimes in the sky we see some kind of uh, patterns. Uh, is there any kind of uh, no? Right. Yeah. Well, what seems to happen with um, the kind of 
pattern clouds that we're familiar with are you can get, in fact, I think I've even had a, uh, a, 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 an image of it, of the stripes that you can see in, um, in some cloud patterns. Did I have? Uh, there we go. <coughs> Um, yeah, I mean that's a particularly striking example, but you know we're all familiar with these these stripes, and you can also sometimes see sort of cell shapes. Um, sometimes clouds, uh, blobs of clouds separated by clear sky, or sometimes the reverse, they're almost a network of clouds with clear blobs in between them. And what seems to be uh, at least one of the predominant uh, mechanisms here is convection. Um, the clouds are forming by convection, by more, more moist air rising up, cooling down, and to the point where the, the moisture condenses into droplets that become clouds. And in convection happens, it, it, it is one of the uh, classic systems that forms patterns. It forms, in fact, yet again, very often spots and stripes. You get these sort of stripes forming from circulating cells that go in different directions. Um, and uh, you can also form some hexagons that way. I, I, I don't think I've got, oh I have, no I have, I've got in the previous slide um, an example of another very regular one up on the, here. This is a convecting fluid, so a fluid heated from below and these circulating hexagons appear. Um, so that's what's happening, that seems to be what's happening with clouds. Um, that uh, that you know, where the air rises at the edges or in the centres, um, that's where the clouds form, that's where they, the, 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 con the condensation happens. Um, so yeah, that's basically what's happening there. I have a question Diffusing and creating this pattern, but um, no, you're right that in other systems, you know, they haven't identified that. And it's, it's interesting that Turing's uh, original uh, inspiration for this, how embryos develop, that doesn't seem to be Turing patterning. It, it's, it's in some ways simpler, in some ways more complex. It's diffusing uh, gradients of diffusing um, um, chemicals, basically, of uh, biochemicals. Um, but that uh, what seems to happen is that you get a, you don't get a sort of a sudden formation of lots of stripes going on. It's a progressive um, uh, complexification of a simple pattern. So you, you, you get a gradient in um, uh, so, so the the the, the, uh, the the biochemical, the morphogen, if you like, is being formed in one part of the embryo and is diffusing. And once the concentration crosses a certain threshold. Um, then a gene gets switched on or off, and so you, then you have two halves, and then you get another sort of center that you know create that, that makes that uh, it, it divides that up into another space, and it becomes more and more complicated. And in each case, there's a particular gene that is creating you know the protein that's diffusing. So it's it's under it's clearly under genetic control. It's not something that sort of you know happens almost by magic by activators and inhibitors. Um, so the idea of, di of diffusion, diffusing morphogens seems to be right, but it's not quite what, it's, it, what Turing suggested, that it's, um, it's, you know, there's, there's, there's much more uh, genetic control going on, to, that this, it's a progressive uh, complication of an initially simple pattern. Um, so you know, that's, that's true, and it will be, and it's, so you sometimes see suggestions that somehow Turing patterns are the reason why everything in nature and everything in biology is patterned, and it certainly isn't the case. But I think it, it, there's certainly a very strong case now that these sorts of markings are, you know, probably... 
No, but that's right. It's not, you know, you can create computer models that very plausibly sort of explain what's going on here, but you're right, and no one has pinpointed the chemicals involved. And until that happens, it's really still just a hypothesis. Find it, I mean, I, it's, in the cases that I showed, the pedestrian motion in traffic, you, you get things that can be really quite regular in traffic. For example, you can get self organization into, into <coughs> waves of congestion, into so this sort of stop and go traffic where you don't just get a, a, a jam, you get a jam that then forms another one, just like the sand ripples, a little way away, and then another jam. So you're going into a jam and out again and in and out. We, you know, everyone is familiar with that, who drives. So you can get certain irregularities there. Um, when you get into, I mean, some people have actually used Turing-type uh, models to try to understand crime, to understand why sometimes with, uh, with uh, crime, that you do, it doesn't just happen, you know, universe, it doesn't happen the same everywhere. You get these hot spots forming. And um, it seems that certainly there's been a model put forward that suggests that there it's a kind of a Turing-type system, an activator inhibitor system. You get a hot spot and then another one a certain distance away. Um, and you know, they don't coalesce, they, 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 it has to be a certain distance away. Um, so that's, you know, some of that thinking is going in that direction. Um, in economics, of course, there has been a big long debate about whether there are regularities in terms of, I mean, people, economists talk about these economic cycles, um, which to my mind uh, it drives me a bit crazy because they're not cycles in the same sense as you get sort of cycles in uh, population dynamics that are, you know, often very regular waves. Um, they're, they're very irregular um, and they're, you know, they're finely structured on all sorts of scales. Um, but nevertheless, there's something that recurs that, you know, as we would know to our cost, um, that you still get uh, periods of boom and bust, even if they're not perfectly regular. And I think it seems pretty clear now, that even though traditional economics tends to, divide, to, to ignore this, it seems pretty clear that that's to do with the inherent dynamics of, the economic, of, of an economic market. It's not something that just happens because every 50 years you get some political disturbance that creates it. Um, it's, it's intrinsic to the way markets work. And so, you know, this, this is uh, crucial to understanding that it's not something you can just, uh, you can just sort of do away with, as our politicians were telling us 10 years ago, they have done away with boom and bust, it, because it's, 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 it's inherent to the nature of the economic system. It's part of its dynamics. Um, so, you know, I think in all sorts of social situations where we see some kind of, if not regularity, at least pattern of the sort that I showed you with the zebra strike, where you've got some sort of pattern that's, that's not identical or not identically repeating, but it's nevertheless recurring. different patterns uh, mapped onto the, condi the conditions that control which pattern you've got. And so, for example, with the chemical systems, in fact, I, um, it is just the one before this, this switch between spots and stripes can be brought about by a change in temperature, so, which is changing the rates of diffusion of the molecules. So you cross a particular threshold 
and you suddenly get a switch from one pattern to another. And that's a crucial thing with these systems, that um, very often you have, it's not a gradual change, it's a, it's a threshold thing. You find exactly the same in traffic, and people have, created, have mapped out the phase uh, diagrams of traffic, where you get these different stop and go flow, or a horrible big jam, or, um, or you know, congested but moving traffic. Um, the, and you, it seems that the switches from one to another happen at quite sharp thresholds in, say, the density of traffic. Uh, that would be the, the sort of crucial parameter that, that determines the change. Um, so that's really what you want to try to, once you've got a pattern forming system, what you want to try and map out. You know, what are the, what are the parameters that, when you change them, they create different patterns? And how big are the domains of each pattern? Where do the boundaries lie? Convection is another one. That uh, you know, there are many patterns that are formed in convecting fluids or in different sort of convecting geometries. And uh, again, you know, how how quickly the convection is happening. So how hot uh, the sort of bottom of the fluid is, if you like. You know, that's the control parameter that will switch from one pattern to another. And so you know, it, it, it's that kind of thing. It's particularly the fact that there are these thresholds and these domains of patterns that uh, enables you to sort of start thinking in, you know, that, 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 that enables you to see that it's not just something that is sort of happening fairly randomly, but actually within, when you're within one of those domains, you can change things quite a bit, and the, the global pattern won't change very much. Again, we find this with, with human behavior, that, you know, if you're in the middle of one of those areas, then uh, changing the rules a little bit isn't going to make a lot of difference. And I think that that's probably what happens also with uh, with a lot of political uh, decision making. That that you know people, for example, argue about um, crime, whether having more severe penal systems is going to make a difference, or whether it's all to do to do, to do with socio-economic hardship, and you know whether alleviating that will make a difference. Well, it probably depends on where you are in that map of possible states, whether that will make a difference to how much crime there is or not. And if you're near a boundary, it might make a huge difference. But if you're not, then tinkering with those things isn't going to make a lot of difference. So that's really, if you're certainly in social systems, if you want to understand what's going to be effective and what isn't, you need to get that map, that phase diagram of the outcomes, to figure out where you are on that map, to you know, to know how much freedom you've got.